Imagine you're running for president. Everybody else seems to be. How would you decide your foreign policy? Perhaps by bringing together one of the nation's leading diplomats and one of the nation's leading soldiers, such as Ambassador Charles Hill and Marine Corps General Jim Mattis? Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A career Foreign Service officer, Charles Hill served as an advisor to Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and George Shultz. After leaving the State Department, Ambassador Hill served as an advisor to United Nations General Secretary Boutros Boutros Ghali. Now a fellow at the Hoover Institution, Ambassador Hill is also the diplomat in residence at Yale, where he teaches a seminar, legendary in Yale circles, entitled Studies in Grand Strategy. James Mattis enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1969, and by the time he retired as a full general in 2013, he had led soldiers in combat in Iraq during the Persian Gulf War, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq once again during the Iraq War. He had also served as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation and as commander of the United States Central Command, where he was responsible for the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. General Mattis, like Ambassador Hill, is now a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Charlie and Jim, welcome. Okay, <clears throat> since everybody else is doing it, I've decided to run for president. Now, I have phone calls to make and money to raise. Time is limited. Just tell me what I need to know about the world, would you please? We begin where we more or less have to begin. We're shooting this the week that President Obama announced that he has, he and five other nations have reached a nuclear deal with Iran. Two quotations, New York Times editorial board. Quote, the final deal does what no amount of vague threats had managed to do before. It puts strong, verifiable limits on Iran's ability to develop a nuclear weapon. Close quote. The Wall Street Journal editorial board. Quote, the agreement all but guarantees that Tehran will eventually become a nuclear power while limiting the ability of a future president to prevent it. Close quote. Good deal or bad deal, Charlie? The first thing, since you're running for president, is to know that the international system is coming apart. It's a global matter. We can get into that later, yes. as you might wish. Uh, this agreement uh, fits into that. It uh, is really perhaps... Fits into an overall disintegration. Overall disintegration. Uh, it is perhaps the most astonishing shift in international politics and security in modern diplomatic history. Uh, it is strategically dangerous. Uh, Iran has been an enemy of this international system since it uh, became the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979. It has been a relentless, deceptive, deceitful, anti-world order regime. Uh, its record is consistent. It's never wavered from it. Its enemy is America, you know, death to America. And what has just happened is that the United States has just handed over its leading role in the Middle East to Iran and provided a kind of dowry to go along with it. As the U.S. seems to be leaving this region in the way it has been in the leading role before. By a dowry, you mean we lift the sanctions and they start making money, <clears throat> cash right away. It comes with a big package that will ensure <clears throat> that Iran will become almost certainly the leading power in the region for the foreseeable future, or the near future anyway. Others will challenge it. Uh, it is going to make Iran a major power internationally if it goes on the way it appears to go now. Jim, you warned me that you didn't want to talk about the deal until you'd had a chance to read all 159 pages, all five appendices, and, and look at what various people were saying. Fine. Fair enough. You have standards. I understand. Let me give you a quotation, though, to which I, I, uh, on which I would like you to comment. Frederick Kagan in the Wall Street Journal, quote, the deal commits the West to removing almost all sanctions on Iran, including 
most of those imposed to reduce terrorism or to prevent weapons proliferation. That is, it's not just a nuclear deal. We don't just lift those sanctions. We lift almost all sanctions on Iran. Thus, the agreement ensures that Iran will be able to expand its conventional military capabilities as much as the regime pleases. Close quote. You know something about their conventional military capabilities and how they've used it. What do you think about that? How have they? Charlie just said their record is consistent. How have you experienced it? The Iranians, as Henry Kissinger has said very clearly, are not acting, conducting themselves as a nation state. They're conducting themselves as a revolutionary cause. So as we look at them in their nation state role, we have to consider their capabilities. In this case, in this negotiation, we are aware that there are numerous threats that emanate from Iran, but we voluntarily limited the negotiation to one alone, the latent nuclear weapons program. Right. There's also a counter maritime threat, there's a cyber threat. There's a ballistic missile threat, then there's one you could call Quds Force, MOIS, surrogates, proxies like Lebanese Hezbollah, terrorism. And we intentionally to address what the Americans believed was the most significant threat, limited the discussion, the negotiation to one, but it, you cannot limit the implications to one alone. So we removed all of the uh, sanctions and now those other regionally destabilizing threats are certainly subject to being reinforced with some of the benefits of this negotiation. Whether it's a good uh, framework for the future or not will come out in the, uh, in the execution of it. However, there is certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of aspects of it that put us in a less favorable position. But we'll have to see if in the long run the, uh, the squeeze is worth the juice, basically, and we'll just have to watch for that. And the next administration will have something to say about it. One point I would make up front, though, is the sanctions are over. They're done. Uh, Those it doesn't can't matter what the U.S. Congress does. The sanctions are off. What can the U.S. Congress do? I don't. I, this, I, it's only been a couple days, and I've had other things to do because, as I said, I'm running for president. But uh, I've been trying to figure out how it is that this can be treated as anything other than a treaty. This is surely the most significant arrangement deal, I'm trying to avoid the word treaty, that we're, we've entered into with, any, with another country in, what, at least a couple of decades, I would imagine, and Congress doesn't, uh, uh, tell me how this happens. Uh, would, this process that was arranged for the 60 days. Congress uh, gets 60 days. We'll go forward. Right. Uh, as you're suggesting, I agree that there's almost no way that that is going to do other than have a lot of animosity in Washington when the August recess is over. But it's going to, this agreement will, will be put into effect. The president will veto anything that Congress comes up with. Uh, they won't be able to override the veto. In a way, this is going to be very interesting. It's going to make a lot of uh, news. But it really doesn't, it doesn't matter, except in one thing that you suggest. And that has yet to be kind of worked out by those who are concerned about it. And that's the constitutional issue. In other words, this is, be, apart from the 60 days, apart from the Congress, this is beginning to look like a deliberate attempt to circumvent the Constitution. That is, you take, you negotiate a treaty in its expansiveness, in its details, in the play out in many, many different areas of what is in this document, this is a treaty. Or but to put it, it the other way around, if this isn't a treaty, what, what is? is? What mm -hmm. is? But it's not called a treaty. It's not called an executive agreement by which the president could do this. It, in some sense, is not an agreement, although we're calling it an agreement. They don't call it an agreement. The, they meaning the, the administration. No, Iran the Ara the and, Iranians. and the, they, right. they have agreed not to call it an agreement. If you listen to the National Security Advisor talking about this in a briefing, she kept saying deal. It's a deal. And as a deal, you see that there are, the language in there is Iran intends to do this. Iran intends to do that. 
But the point of, of this is, and here's the key matter, is the White House now drafting not a, not a one, but two resolutions for the Security Council. One, the would, Security Council. one would be a resolution by which the Security Council would revoke its previous resolutions of sanctions on Iran. That's okay, that can be done. A second one, however, could be asking the Security Council to welcome and authorize this agreement per se. And that would put it, and, and this is one where the U.S. will not veto it, and therefore that would put it into international law, which would make it the law of the United States, and a way the entire thing would then circumvent the advice and consent of the Senate that a treaty would get. Charlie, you are discussing this in sober, straightforward tones, the same that you employ in the classrooms at Yale University. But is this not breathtaking? Is this not shocking? Well, we've seen for some time now in the last few years, one after another, not attempt, but successful circumventing of this or that procedure or assumed to be requirement of the way that the American government was designed to, to operate. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Whatever the terms of the deal, does the procedure concern you? What Charlie just described, does this concern you? What concerns me more, Peter, is we live today, I believe, in an America with the most polarized electorate since 1865. And why that concerns me is we are sending people to Washington who are literally going there proudly saying, I will not compromise on principle, and they declare everything a principle. This system was set up with three co-equal branches of government. Uh, we have a bicameral legislature. Certainly some branch of government can block the government from acting, but it takes all three working together. It takes the Senate and the House working together. And right now, I think we have more and more people who are reluctant to engage because they believe the people they are talking with aren't just wrong, aren't just, and sometimes in in the kind of language you use in politics, we say they're dumb. Okay, I accept that. But today we say they're evil, and you don't compromise with evil. We'd better get back to compromising and learning how you govern in a democracy with diversity, or we're going to continue to see these kind of end runs taken by various political parties, various people, in order to try to circumvent the requirement for a compromise they believe is unachievable. You sound as though you're blaming Congress. You sound no. as though you're saying the president had no choice because he knew Congress would be yeah. intractable. No, I don't think anyone who is in Washington right now uh, can exempt themselves from rolling up their sleeves and sitting down and listening to each other and not just being willing to listen to each other, be willing to per be persuaded by someone with a different point of view. Not everything's about principle in this world. Some of it's about tactics. You look at the way we ran this, uh, this country over many, many years, the only time we couldn't compromise on something that was significant, we led to our civil war. We've been able to compromise generally. And as a result, we were able to craft a foreign policy, which, for example, containment against the Soviet Union was exercised differently by different administrations, but the, the strategy was bipartisan. We don't have that today. I'd like to, Charlie, you talked about the end of the nation, the well, international, in the international system. system, YouTube video. I'm from Sham. I've been from Omar for more than 28 years. This is the first time I entered Iraq without a visa. I'm from Tunis. I'm the first time I entered Iraq without a visa or a passport or anything. All right, so what you've got there is ISIS putting up a video on YouTube proudly proclaiming the obliteration, in effect, of an international border, international borders. They want to caliphate, they want to eliminate international borders, and the significance of this is? Uh, this is exactly, it goes to the heart of what we're talking about here, and it couldn't be more appropriate. Uh, in another event, another report, I heard one of those fighters uh, answering a question from a reporter, what do, what do you want? What are you doing? And the answer was, we are against countries. 
we're against countries. There's got to be a universal one world <clears throat> rule and it's got to be that of the Islamists. And therefore, this is really the latest in, in modern histories uh, attempts to overthrow and destroy the international state system, which is, the, which is coextensive with the modern world. It's about 350 years, 400 years old, and it's the way the world has agreed, the nations of the world have agreed to try to work together in a cooperative way. That the fundamental Through unit of diplomacy, diplomacy is the Professional nation. militaries, right. these are all part of one. It's, it's a very simple system. And the fact that it is simple has enabled it to become worldwide because you can join it and not give up your own culture, your own politics, your own language, your own religion. You just have to abide by the few things, international law, be a state, uh, and you're in the system. So here we have an ideology, and it's a religious-driven ideology, which means it's political. It isn't really Islam. It's, it's a politicized ideological form of religion that is saying it's against the entirety of the way the world works. It's against the world order. And Iran is... On, it, the unusual thing about Iran, which is really significant and, and not really recognized outside of Iran, is that uniquely... It is both inside the international state system and its enemy. When, it, when the Ayatollah Khomeini, his revolution took over Iran in 79, he stepped into the legitimate, diplomatically recognized state of Iran and right. took the seats at the UN and began to act <clears throat> in some sense as a legitimate member of the system. Right. At the same time, their ideology and their practice was terrorism and to oppose that system and to try to tear it down at every, every possible occasion. So they have been able to use this back and forth. And they go in one direction, one side of the fence when it suits their purposes, and then they'll come to the other side and say, oh, no, you can't do that because we're a legitimate state. So, and, and there's no other state really that's like that. Okay. So if I were a political candidate, I'd say, well, this is all very alarming and really quite heavy, unsuitable for speeches. And there must be a way of lightening it up and finding a way out. And here's the way. And, and President Obama has not done that bad a job. <clears throat> By progressively disengaging from the region and making it clear that we were going to bear as little of the burden in the Middle East as possible, he has more or less forced the hands of Egypt, where President Sisi has now, he's attacked ISIS in Libya after they slaughtered some Egyptians. He's forced the hand of the Saudis, who are bombing Yemen. He's forced the hand of Jordan, where the king himself suited up and flew a combat mission attacking ISIS after they burned a captured Jordanian pilot alive. So that's good news. They're finally fighting their own fight. Let them in the arrange, let, let, them, let them fight it out among themselves. <laughs> that's actually not that bad an outcome. Right, Jim? The generation coming home from World War II learned when America loses interest in the international community, the outcome is horrific. And out of that lesson learned from that terrible World War comes United Nations, NATO, Marshall Plan, Bretton Woods, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, I can go on. But that system is not self-sustaining. It demands tending. And right now, by not tending to it, we watched three fundamental attacks on the state system gaining momentum. Russia wants a veto authority over the diplomatic, economic, and security interests of the nations in the former Soviet Union. We see that loud and clear in the Ukraine when they tried to edge closer to the EU economically. We see it, as Charlie has put it, down with ISIS, literally erasing a border, calling for a caliphate, and attacking the state system. In the South China Sea, we see China going to the classical Chinese tribute model, pay respect, but they too want that same veto authority over the near abroad for them. In South China Sea, they want to say, these is, are the ways that you will conduct your diplomatic, your economic, your security matters. So if the Americans continue to pull back, 
we're going to find the same lessons after we pulled back after World War I. And when the League of Nations failed, we did not join it. And the end result was we paid a terrible price. There are nations out there that yearn for American leadership. And we need to engage more with those nations and perhaps intervene militarily less. Okay, so fine, I take all that. But isn't an answer, isn't it actually a pretty good answer that if Russia is pushing on Europe, let the Europeans push back. Germany is an extremely rich country. They ought to fight some of their own fights, stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. In the Middle East, Egypt is a country of 80 million people. The Saudis are fabulously rich. Jordan may need a little help, but the Saudis and the Egyptians can help them out. We'll give them airplanes as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. In China, tribute model, a thousand years of Chinese history, they've never been globally expansionary. They've never been like the Soviet Union. They've never made claims to the whole world. They want respect and tribute in their region. Let things sort themselves out among the Japanese, the Australians. They'll, they'll, they'll come to some kind of uh, new equilibrium in the region, right? What's, what's, what's wrong with this? This is a little England model, right? This is in the middle of the 19th century, Prime Minister Gladstone was a little Englander. We don't need an empire and the world doesn't need us. And eventually the Little Englanders won in the 20th century and England disengaged and England's a fine, prosperous country. What's wrong with Little America, Charlie? It, and your example would be as in before uh, we got into World War II saying we're not going to get into it because that would be the wise course and it will encourage the, the Danes and the Dutch and the Belgians and the uh, Filipinos and the Cambodians uh, to fight this fight themselves. And we'll, we'll buck them up that way. Uh, so there's that f fallacy in all of this. But this is not that kind of thing anyway. I mean, this is something which is an ideology which is of the kind which is horizontal. States are vertical. The ideology cuts across the state and it's universal. And in the Middle East and elsewhere, I think in populations in Europe and in North America too, in Southeast Asia, there is a constant sense of who's going to win this thing. And what is this thing? This thing is the international order. And when you see the U.S. having been in it, pull out of it, and when the U.S. says in agreeing with Iran in this current situation that we're doing this because we, the Americans, are convinced that this will make Iran a good citizen of the international order. At the same time, we're leaving the international order. Then the people in the region say, this is not going to work that way. This is going to be something where the order is coming down. And part of the fact that the order, or the, the facts showing the order is in disarray, is the fact that the Americans are leaving it. We're going back to a domestic agenda and essentially saying, leaving this to to you and you and you. And what alone would be Iran? And Iran, in fact, would be the, the major power coming out of this in an entire region. And it takes, I don't know exactly the form that it would take, but we know that it would happen. There Probably there are phone calls already taking place between various sheikhs and emirs That's the key in Tehran, point. and they're, what's happening here? What do you, okay, what do you want? It's already been done. It's already happening. Words, it doesn't, in some sense, this is, I don't want to be The diplomatic trivi market has already discounted the United the, States. The perception is what really matters, and the perception is that Iran has gone its way. It doesn't matter to those in the Middle East, to those who are considering this strategically around the world. It doesn't matter whether the Congress does this or that with it. That's, that's the Americans' problem. This thing is already, already done. Jim's point, it's already happened. Those, yes. those, those sanctions are not going to be put back. Jim, the Prime Minister <clears throat> of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, immediately, within minutes of President Obama's announcement of this deal with Iran, called it a historic mistake. That's the phrase, historic mistake. Question, here we have Israel, friends of ours, a democracy, but still only 8 million people. And here we have Iran with a population 10 times bigger. If we have to choose between the two, and the President of the United States seems to think that we do have to, for whatever lip service and friendly general posture of alliance we have toward Israel, 
He's just cut a deal with Iran over Israel's bitter objection. Isn't it only sensible to cut the deal with Iran? Here's the question. Why should Israel matter to us out of proportion to its population and size? It's a dinky little country, Jim. Why does it really matter? Values matter in this world. We were, all of us, born here by accident. We live here by choice. But we have an obligation to turn these values, these freedoms we've enjoyed, over to the next generation. And the idea that freedom is a natural state is not borne out in history. You're going to have to defend freedom. And you don't defend freedom by waiting until it's arrived on our shores. FDR can tell you the penalty for that from Pearl Harbor as we watch the fascists flatten France and, and bombing England and all, and we stayed on the outside for a long time. Like-minded nations that stand for liberal values, they're going to have to band together and protect each other. And if you want a friend when you're in trouble, then you're going to have to be a friend to them when they're in trouble. You subscribe <clears throat> to that? What you have just enunciated is the growing line of those who see that established systems internationally are coming apart. They are saying to themselves, what's going to follow that? What will follow that will be what you described, and that will be hierarchical. That is where you eliminate things like this, and you do say, look, uh, this is a big country, you're a little country. This in uh, Thucydides is the Melian dialogue the Athenians, uh, in their most awful imperial style, come to the island of Milos and they say, you're little, we're big, we're strong, you're weak. Doesn't it just stand to reason you do what we say? And if you don't do what we say, we're going to slaughter you all. And we can now begin to see some of this coming out in, particularly in China, among scholars and serious people, very smart, academic serious people who are sensing that the world order that China came into in the modern era is not permanent. We're not in some kind of Whig form of history that just gets better and better and better as it goes along and it's not stable Francis forever. Fukuyama is simply mistaken. Yes. Democracy and free markets are not an end state of history. <clears throat> they're not if they're not upheld. Got it. So with, with this, we're seeing in the Chinese uh, kind of scholarly, semi-scholarly um, articles, talking about what will be the next form of international organization, and it will be hierarchical. Confucius, in, in a sense, that is, I'm up, you're down, I'm stronger, you're weaker, I'm the daddy, you're the baby, and here's how we'll run things. The idea of the doctrine, which we now are in, of the, at least juridically, of the equality of states, to them is, is looking more and more ridiculous. All right. Jim, you joined the Marine Corps in 1969, as I recall. So you became a Marine while we were still in Vietnam. 10 years later, you were a senior figure, 1979, in the Marine Corps, when we had spent, in some ways, a decade in retreat, or at least the Soviet Union had spent a decade. Well, as a captain, as a company commander, Cap company not, commander. not your senior. OK, well, I would have saluted you. <laughs> uh, so 79, you see our hostages taken in Iran. The Soviet Union by then has spent the 70s building a deep water navy. They're all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the situation today. What's the most dangerous? I'm asking you fr from your own experience. I think uh, there's different ways to rack and stack various dangers. But I would certainly include the American economic revival and the uh, bottom line is the lack of fiscal sustainability of our current governmental spending is probably the most key national security concern because no nation in history has maintained its military power if it didn't keep its fiscal house in order. So how you unleash the American economic recovery so that we get solvency and security both as a result is critical. And then you can rack and stack from Russia uh, with a significant nuclear overtone to, uh, to what we're hearing out of Putin, to the cyber threats that, are threat that we're all aware of today. And certainly at the same time, we have to manage our relationship with China in a way that the competition does not go military. 
Uh, there's lesser threats, Iran, ISIS, North Korea. Uh, but this is something that demands traditional diplomacy. Uh, it means we've got to engage constantly. It doesn't mean we have to send invading armies everywhere, but it requires a strategic appreciation of the situation. We have a strategic atrophy in this country today. We have atrophied our strategic thinking. We have very little ends, ways, and means coming out of Washington, D.C. That could be because our lack of historic understanding because of the way we're teaching in schools today. It could be we just don't reward strategic thinking anymore in a government. But for whatever reason, there is a lack of strategic thinking today uh, inside the government processes. And if you don't get that straight, You'll lose your diplomats and soldiers' lives, you'll lose your treasury, and you'll lose your moral credibility in the process. Two quotations. Excuse me. Let me set it up a little bit. You're both saying that the United States has a, that it's us or, it's us or disorder, it's us or chaos, it's us or war is in what really, in some way, what you're saying here. And you know, that, that's a pretty striking formulation. So two quotations. Here's Ronald Reagan in 1983, quote, I've always believed that some divine plan placed this great continent here between the oceans to be found by people who had a special love for freedom, that this blessed land was set apart in a special way, close quote. President Barack Obama in 2012, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism, close quote. The United States, I'm just asking what it feels like to you. The United States, a nation set apart or just another country? Well, I think all you'd have to do to answer that question, Peter, is uh, take the border patrol away from the borders and let the free market of people go wherever they wish to in this world and watch tens of millions come running to America. Uh, I think that those kind of movements would answer your question in a very, uh, very mathematical way. Um, so I, but I, I think that we do forget at times, <clears throat> those of us so lucky to live here, uh, and that can be whether you're the President of the United States or you're a kid growing up on the Columbia River, that we, we are a very special place. We come to take it for granted and we don't realize just how fortunate we are. Okay, Jim, so special place, we have six, for in, as of 2010, you may know better than I, this is the most recent year for which I could find figures. As of 2010, the United States has 662 overseas military bases in 38 different countries. You're just asking too much of the American people. Barack Obama didn't get to be president by accident. People voted for him twice. They're sick of trying to run the world. People are tired. They're just tired. And you and you are just asking too much. How do you answer that? Well, first of all, I think that engaging with the world does not require some set piece uh, involvement in the world with tens of thousands of troops. And some of those bases, let's be honest here, there are a half dozen Marines guarding an embassy somewhere. That's hardly an onerous, uh, I mean, so be, be careful with which statistics you use. But I think, too, we have to look at this point in time, the United States is seen as special, as a, as a, a banner carrier for freedom. And we do carry an awful lot with us uh, in that role in terms of convincing the rest of the world that human dignity, that freedom, that tolerance for diversity is the right way to go. And so the idea that you pull back and somehow this system just tends itself, I think is false. It's not something I think that requires uh, the worst case uh, kind of support. And you'll hear it, well, it's either we go to war or we negotiate. Well, the traditional diplomatic tools do not require only two options. There, there's a host of ways that we carry out our, or express our values. We don't have to find ourselves into these, either we all come home and do nation building at home or we go off overseas 
with 100,000 man armies and invade countries. That's not so, the option. So here, oh, 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 okay, well put, and I grant that point, but here I am in, in our, this little conceit with which we've set up this show, I'm pretending I'm running for president. We know from the Cold War that sustaining American involvement in the world is hard work. It requires sacrifice. It requires taxes that, and a military establishment bigger than would otherwise be the case. And it requires attracting really good talent mm -hmm. to the Marine Corps, to the diplomatic corps. And as opposed to this Milky Way you were talking about of money and startups and you need a few of those kids to devote themselves to public service. And here's what I hear the two of you saying. Here, there's no, really only one good reason for doing that, and it's fear. If we're not there, if we don't involve ourselves in the world, chaos will follow. We have to take this role because the world is too scary if we don't. Can you persuade people that there's something ennobling about the effort? <clears throat> this is a fallen world. This world is really trouble. And there's no doubt about that. Uh, so uh, without security, without stability, then nothing else can really be done successfully. And it is the, the Washington politicians who have been telling the American people that they are tired. The American people, I don't believe, are tired. And I think the politicians are doing this because they have their own agenda. So leadership... Washington's I mean, worn out, not the country. Right. <clears throat> Secondly, the, whether it's 600 bases or whether it's 400 or 200 bases, those positions that we hold are our best guardian against war. <clears throat> what is happening now with the fear that Putin's Russia is going to encroach or worse on one of the Baltic states, Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania? NATO is talking about moving people, moving troops, or at least pre-positioning equipment, which is much less desirable, into those places because that, that presence would be a deterrent for any Russian move. So it is not that having these bases overseas is so, is so horrible. It's, that's what is real, really holding the line against trouble. Last question. Here's one sentence from a speech that John Kennedy was scheduled to deliver on November 22nd, 1963, quote, we in this country, in this generation, by destiny rather than by choice, are the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. Is that even intelligible today? Do, does, that, does that strike you as a true statement about the United States today? Well, I, I think we've been pretty inarticulate about what it is we'll stand for and even more importantly, what it is we won't tolerate in the world. Uh, we were given these freedoms by the previous generation that did pay a price, and we're all fond of saying freedom is not free. The question is, are we willing to protect those freedoms? And not to do so in a macho, muscle-flexing way, but in an authoritative, decisive, alliance-building manner that takes a lot of the burden off us, but not the, the leadership burden. We need to be able to lead. Charlie? It goes back to what Jim was saying a while ago, it's education. We have changed our education in the last 30 or 40 years so that students are really not being taught history. They're not being taught what it was that got us here. History gave way to being taught issues. And issues are something abstract. They're just out there. They somehow just show up. And that is the fundamental reason why we have this seeming obliviousness or ignorance about the way the world has got to be managed in order to make everything else work well. If we don't know that, then it's all going to fall apart. Charlie Hill, Jim Mattis, thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson.